objection. The package is adopted. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Francis Steed Sellers, a senior writer here at The Post. Today, as part of our This is Climate series, we're going to be talking about land and ocean conservation, as well as the global threat to biodiversity. A little later, I'm going to be joined by National Geographic's explorer and resident Enrique Sala. But first, I'm very pleased to welcome to the program the mayor of Boise, Idaho, Lauren McLean. Lauren McLean, a very warm welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you so much, Francis. It's great to join you today. I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk. And we have lots to learn from you. Um, you come from a state that, fair or not, is often thought of as, as one of the most conservative and perhaps not in the forefront of combating climate change. But there you are in Boise, and in 2021, you joined a coalition of 70 mayors committed to conserving 30% of American lands by 2030. Tell us about that group, how it came to be, and what it means for you there in Boise. Sure, thanks. You know, I come from a state where the people of Idaho are bound to the land and connected to the land. And so I'll often talk about it in that way when people are surprised that um, in Boise, our residents value leadership around climate action, value leadership around public lands and open space conservation and preservation. Um, but ultimately, this is about protecting the people that we care deeply about and the places that we love at a time that it's become more and more important to do that. And this, it, the America the Beautiful initiative was a perfect way for us and me to connect with other mayors in other cities doing this as we built out our own program to protect 30% of our um, open space, um, parks, open lands, and of course protect our clean water in Boise. Tell me a little bit more about the initiative and how it works across different levels of government with federal, state, and, and the mayor's involvement. Sure. Well, you know, and in Boise, we're doing it a Boise way, which is often what we do in Boise, Idaho. Um, if we looked at the 30 by 30 initiative, the America the Beautiful initiative, and said, okay, um, our residents are committed to um, setting aside and protecting open space. And we know we need to do that, especially in these times now when people need a place to go outside, spend time, reconnect with each other, take a break, um, and then move on into their lives. And so we, we played a little bit with the idea of 30 by 30, and we said, we are going to double our tree canopy in the city of Boise, which will be a 30% um, coverage with trees. So planting a seed in the Idaho forest for every resident, we're halfway there. And then we wanna plant a tree for every household. So 30% tree coverage. We know that we can't do this without our residents. And so we are increasing by 30% our volunteer activities and opportunities for our residents to engage with us in protecting the people and places that we love. We have said that we are going to spend $30 million to protect open space. And so laid out a program that takes care of the people in place of Boise, but also prepares us for other climate action to ensure we're ready for the future. So it sounds as if you've been able to, to sort of chart your own path with this program, which initially was criticized a little for lacking details. Has that actually proven to be an advantage for you because you could do it the Boise way? I think it's been a great advantage. And because really it's, it's mayors, local governments, tribes and others that know best um, because we work side by side with our residents, how we need to prepare our own communities for a climate constrained future. So protecting our parks, setting aside more open space, building tree canopies to cool our neighborhoods, making sure that we've protected our clean water um, through clean water action and protecting our river are solutions that not only help us here at home, but then do have larger impacts when we all come together and do this at the city level around the country. 
So if you weren't doing this so locally, if you emphasize the federal government's involvement, do you think you would face more skepticism in the state? Well, our boys, our residents, the people of Boise expect us to lead on these issues. We are tied deeply to the communities that we live in, the landscape that makes Boise unique. And so rather than pushback, I'm finding that residents want to be involved. We've passed a program and a policy that says every resident, every kid, frankly, should, should be and will be able to walk to a park within 10 minutes. Our residents are helping us do that. We um, find ways to clean up the Boise River and take action. Our residents are helping us do that. So this is both community driven and people driven. And we found nothing but support for these initiatives because it's really based around Boise values. Another asset that that Idaho is sitting on, it turns out, is a huge amount of cobalt. Um, and I know there's controversy about the way that cobalt could be brought up, but for viewers, it's a, a mineral that's very necessary for electric vehicles and largely supplied now from China. What's your view? Should uh, the federal government ease permitting requirements? Can mining be sustainable or done in a responsible way? You know, in Boise, we have more conversations about how to protect the local landscape than we do in these mining conversations nationally. And I'd say from an electrification perspective, um, it's important that we electrify and we are expanding electrification in city buildings, of course, looking at our fleets um, and trying to, again, focus as mayor um, on the local solutions that prepare us for a climate constrained future so that our residents have jobs, so they live in a clean and healthy place and have access to the clean power they need. And talking about a clean and healthy pace, you also have the remarkable public lands around you and remarkable open land, a huge amount of biodiversity. What's the greatest threat you see to that biodiversity in Boise well, and around Boise? Sure. The reason that Boiseans are so committed to protecting our open space, um, and you're right, we are surrounded by beautiful um, public land, both federal land and, and land now owned by Boise, but our residents are committed to protecting our open space and to protecting our clean river, the clean water that runs through our community, um, because we recognize that as our community grows, as our region grows, it becomes more and more important to have those experiences, not only for us, but for our kids and their kids into the future. Mamakane, tell me a little bit about the process of conserving lands. How is it done? Um, take, step us a little bit through the process if the federal government is conserving or the state is conserving land how does that negotiation happen well we are blessed to be um, a city that's situated by beautiful federal lands that are managed by both the forest service and the blm however in our own city and in lands adjacent to our city and we've protected lands ourselves because our residents have said twice and set aside 20 million dollars to purchase easements to purchase tracts of lands to set it aside, set it aside for generations to come. And as part of that 30 by 30 America, the beautiful initiative, we've made a commitment that by 2030, we'll have set aside $30 million to help us make those acquisitions to protect, protect land forever. Back in 2021, when you joined that initiative, you said that conservation was at a, a red or a blue issue. Um, now a year on, um, do you still believe that or have you have your views changed? Well, this is a people issue. It's this is this is this is about people and it's about place. And Boiseans know that, Idahoans know that, that we will do what we can, we, we will do what we must to protect the places that we love because it creates place for the people and that we care deeply about. And tell me about the public's response to these initiatives. It sounds as if you have great support. What are the big challenges in bringing people around? The people of Boise have been very supportive, and I am so grateful that we have as, enga as engaged a community as we do. So I referenced our desire to increase civic engagement and volunteerism in the state, in the city to help us um, accomplish these goals. And um, throughout the summer, throughout the year, we have residents that are helping us plant um, sagebrush in the hills, that are helping us clean up our river habitat, that are helping us clean up our parks. Um, and I've found that there's really nothing but support and not just support, but the ask of how can we help do more? And because our residents value the place that we live in, the parks that we've created, the open space that we're saving and the jobs that we're creating through our climate leadership for, for our kids and grandkids. 
So you've also said, I think, that you work with willing landowners. I think that was your phrase. Tell me a little bit more about efforts to conserve private land. Sure. So um, with the city, we will look at how we can work with landowners in achieving easements that are not only um, for people, think trails, um, but from time to time, wildlife areas as well. And so thanks to the residents of Boise who have wanted to tax themselves through levies so that we can set aside open space for generations, we're able to have those conversations with landowners. And I'd love to ask a little more about the shifting demographics of the area. I remember going out and covering the Paradise Fires and seeing people, many people um, moving to Idaho um, was cheaper, but reminded them of the areas they'd come from. Um, in Boise itself, you have a growing tech industry, I think, and one of the biggest semiconductor companies. Um, and then to the north, in the northern part of Idaho, there's been a, a certainly a move to the right. How do these conflicting views come to play into the politics of conservation? The people of Idaho value the land. And so the conversations that we have, the I'd say the, the agreements that we find are on those shared connections to the places that we love most. Now, Boise, you're right. You mentioned um, a sen semiconductor industry. We're so pleased to have Micron based in Boise, and we were deeply pleased and excited that they announced that they'd be building the research and development and a fabrication facility in Boise. They're a great partner, particularly when it comes to our clean water and climate action, where we're piloting with them ways to recycle water and building out a facility that other businesses will be able to use as well as we seek jobs of the future that are reliant on the reuse of resources such as water. So how does that work? Tell me a little bit more about that, that water reuse plant. Is that a model that could be used in other cities? Well, we sure hope so. But the people of Boise two years ago or a year and a half ago, 82%, almost 82% of residents said yes to a $570 million clean water and climate action bond. And in that bond, we shared our goals of creating a facility within the city that would make it possible to clean water to the point where it could be reused so that businesses that are reliant on clean water have a sustainable source of that water into the future. As we think about what climate constrained worlds and what communities will need to have jobs for our kids and grandkids, we wanna make sure that we're ready. Our residents said yes to it, um, and we are busy now, especially after the announcement with Micron, all those jobs it'll bring, developing the plans that make that a reality. Now, McLean, you've, you've settled on this very unifying message about Idahoans caring about the land, um, whether they live in the city or outside the city. Talk to me a little bit about climate communications and the importance of finding the right message that can work in other communities as well. Well, I think about Boise first and foremost, so I'm gonna so I'm gonna talk about that. I mean, this work, and and the steps that we're taking around climate are about is about people. It's about protecting the health and livelihoods of people today, and ensuring that our kids and grandkids in the future will have the same opportunities. It's about the place that we love and protecting those places as we grow. Again. Um, so that we can seek refuge and recreation today, but so that our kids and grandkids as well. And fundamentally, it's about prosperity. These are deep, deep challenges our communities are facing. But if we look at them as opportunities and we take the steps today to ensure that our community is prepared for the future, then not only will we find prosperity today, but our kids and grandkids will have that same opportunity at prosperity into the future. You, you get together or you certainly meet by Zoom with these other 70 mayors who are part of the, the coalition you've joined. Um, is that a shared message or pe do people face different challenges? What lessons do you have to impart from your experience in Idaho to the other city mayors? I'd say we're, we're a medium-sized city with unique challenges based on where we are, the place, the place that we um, that our city is situated in. Every city is different, every community is different, but what we're seeing is that cities are able to put forward solutions. And so as mayors working with my city council, working with our residents, we can put forward Boise solutions that not only help on a larger scale when you put it all together, but importantly ensure um, for a Western city and Ida the Idaho capital city of Boise, that we are setting ourselves up for success in the future. And I see that happening around the country. 
I want to ask you a little bit more specifically about Boise itself. You have pledged to be carbon neutral, I think, by 2050. Outline the steps you will take to get there, what you're doing now and what your longer term goals are. I'm so glad you asked about that because this really forms the foundation from which we believe our economy will, will be resilient and our residents in the future will have opportunity. So citywide, our goals are to be carbon neutral by 2050. Our municipal goal is to be carbon neutral by 2035. So we're taking those steps as a city government, we're learning from them, and then we'll figure out how best to do it citywide. Of course, you know, those final, the final years will be the toughest ones. But right now we're in the midst of our clean electricity goal. By 2030, the city had pledged to be fueled by 100% clean electricity. We're gonna beat that goal. And in the process of getting the clean electricity that we need as a city, we'll then be prepared to do the same thing citywide. And we're gonna take those learnings citywide and help residents help us meet those goals. But because we're gonna be fueled by 100% clean electricity, we're looking at beneficial electrification of our buildings to take advantage of that clean electricity. Um, we have a geothermal system that we are expanding and actually looking at innovation grants with the Department of Energy to expand that system into cooling so that we can use a natural resource to provide clean heat um, to help us along those goals. The electrification of our fleets, of our garbage trucks and recycling trucks are part of that, as, is the, as are the elements of the America the Beautiful initiative, you know, planting trees to cool our neighborhoods. Um, it all helps because then as neighborhoods cool, folks can use less power, spend less money on their bills, comes back to people, place, and ultimately prosperity. And when you're with those mayors, one last question I really would like to ask you is lessons you learn from them. Oh, a mayor today said, um, good mayors borrow the best mayors steal ideas. And so we're <laughs> constantly, we're constantly learning from each other. I'm testing new ideas. You know, I um, learned today about, um, in Madison, some programs they're taking around the housing, the affordable housing they have to make sure that it's um, carbon neutral and ultimately well built in the long run. Learning from agencies that are here about ways that we can stack um, federal grants to meet some of these goals. And so everywhere we're going, um, every conversation that we have, particularly with the organization Climate Mayors, we're learning from each other and then figuring out what we can take home. And if you had one last message to the mayors around the country, even those who haven't joined your coalition, what would it be, just quickly? America the Beautiful gives us an opportunity to do what we know as mayors, we must. And that is protect the people we love, the place that makes our home special, and prepare for the future. Boiseans, and this is really my message, Boiseans um, know that this is important, that we must do this, and I deeply appreciate the partnership I have with our residents, and with other agencies, with businesses and others at the universities even, and helping us achieve these clean energy, carbon neutral, and ultimately America the beautiful goals um, for the future of our city. Mayor Lauren McLean, thank you so much. Mayor of Boise, Idaho, thank you for sharing your message on Washington Post Live. Thank you so much. It was great to see you. It was great to have you. I will be back soon, so stay with us. I'll be talking to National Geographic Explorer and Residence, Enrique Sala. At Esri, for over five decades, we've been the leader in geographic information systems, a technology that enables people in every industry on the planet to use maps and data to take on challenges large and small, like how to protect the Earth and how to plan. GIS helps our users to integrate layers of data, turning complexity into clarity. Hi there, my name is Lana Wong, and I'm excited to speak today with Jack Dangerman, the president and founder of Esri, the world's sixth largest privately held software company. Founded in 1969 and headquartered in Southern California, Esri is widely recognized as the technical and market leader in geographic information systems, or GIS, and location intelligence technology. Jack is recognized not only as a pioneer in spatial analysis for government and business, but also as one of the most influential people worldwide in GIS, mapping, and geospatial technology. So Jack, let's dive in. 
Why are biodiversity and conservation of natural areas so important today? Well, we might start with a kind of contextual setting of where we're at. You know, we live in a interconnected, diverse, evolving world that is increasingly fragile because of the human footprint. In other words, humans' involvement in this evolution of our planet is having, because of our careless living and because of our sort of overpopulated state, is having negative effects on many frontiers of our world. Conservation of pieces of our natural world are really important at this stage because we're losing huge amounts of di diversity, biodiversity, and one doesn't actually understand, frankly, the, the implication of those, those biodiversity losses. We know from use cases like in Yellowstone, when wolves were taken out of the ecosystem, it caused massive ecological collapse in, in various areas. Well, we're losing today thousands of different species every year. We don't even know what they are. They've not even been described. The, the vision of being able to protect geographies in natural states, uh, but the kind of 30 by 30 or 50 by 50 world that has been described is amazing because it simply says, we don't know, therefore we should protect and uh, protect areas like the Amazon, a kind of the lungs of our planet so that we can conserve not only biodiversity, but also keep an ecological balance of this world that we live in. Great, and so how do you think conservation of nature will help climate action? Well, these are interrelated subjects. You know, people are concerned about the human footprint and the huge amount of carbon that we're uh, emitting to the atmosphere. This is the fundamental cause of climate change today. What happens with nature is it can, natural areas, plants particularly, and the oceans also play a role in this, they sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. And so by conserving geographies like natural preserves, like the Amazon, what happens is they have a kind of ecological role, ecosystem services role of pulling carbon out, which is a win-win proposition when we talk about climate. Absolutely. And so you mentioned the 30 by 30 initiative. Can you tell us why people are advocating for the protection of 30% of the world's land and waters by 2030? Some people say it's not enough. I mean, the research by E.O. Wilson, uh, the famous uh, ecologist, suggested 50%. Uh, but uh, leaders now are con con you know, getting together and agreeing, like happened last month in, uh, in Canada, that 30 by 30 at least is an achievable goal that we can accomplish in the next, uh, in the next few years. Uh, and that will, that will stabilize some of the ecological loss by setting aside these areas where nature can continue to evolve. It's happening in the state of California with our governor's leadership. It's happening at the national level with uh, President Biden setting up a, uh, America the Beautiful Environment. And these, these are major footprints and commitments that I think are commitments to the future of humanity and life itself on the planet. And in all of this, what makes maps so important? Well, maps have been a kind of language for human beings for thousands of years, a kind of framework for civilization to both understand our world, how to navigate and find places, but also to describe it uh, with different layers of information. We can not only uh, organize information properly so that we can understand what's happening, but we can also make predictions like the weather predictions are done by the climate people, we can also predict what's happening with nature. So this has evolved actually from paper maps into digital maps and ultimately into geospatial geographic information systems where this information is being compiled, organized, and then uh, visualized. Like, like examples for normal people, they would understand the maps that were made for COVID, looked at over a trillion times, the John Hopkins map, for example. People are beginning to understand their world through this powerful visualization language and also make assessments. So in organizing the 30 by 30 initiatives, our national governments around the world are mapping and understanding where they should make the allocations better by bringing together all the information that can support decision making effectively. So this is a, this is a powerful time we're living in, the power of, of geographic information coming together, 
communicating with humans, communicating with decision makers so that they can better understand and act. It's absolutely a, an amazing uh, application of technology for good. And so on that note, can you explain how geospatial technology can help? I would simply say GIS itself is that information system that can give us guidance to bring all of our science together, all of our thinking together, all our design thinking together uh, so that it can be a framework for positive change. Thank you so much, Jack. And thank you for all the important work that you and Esri are doing. And as we embark on this new year, I think committing to climate action and protecting biodiversity for people and planet would be a great New Year's resolution for us all. So thank you for joining us. And now over to our colleagues at the Washington Post. terrified. I didn't know if the, if the corals would still be dead or there would be so, some sign of recovery. And I couldn't wait. I just jumped in the water and I couldn't believe it. From the surface to as far as I could see, intact. These layers and layers of coral plates. And my first thought was, yes, this reef is resilient. This reef has come back. This reef is like the phoenix. It has been reborn from its own ashes. Welcome back. For those of you just joining us, I'm Frances Steed Sellers, a senior writer at the Washington Post. I'm now joined by Enrique Sala. He's National Geographic Explorer in Resident and also founder of the Pristine Seas Program at National Geographic. And he's here to talk to us about the oceans and the vital role they play in conservation. Enrique Sala, welcome back to Washington Post Live. Hi, Francis. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for showing these images from one of my favorite places on Earth. Well, we're, we're very pleased to have you. We spoke a couple of years ago, I guess, right before the pandemic, and it's wonderful to have you back virtually. Um, I want to ask you first about your title. It's such a cool title. What's it take to be an explorer in residence? And uh, how does one get to be one? Well, explorer in residence is like an oxymoron, right? Because right. explorers are <laughs> supposed to be out there, not here. Right. Um, but well, it means in my case, exploring residence is using the best of uh, what National Geographic is well known for, exploration, research, communication, education, to foster conservation, to help protect vital places in the ocean so humanity has a future. So the ocean covers, I think, 70% of the world's surface, and yet it's so often missed out of conversations about conservation. Help us to understand that, put that all together. Why is the ocean so important for the future of the planet? Well, without everything we need to survive depends on the work of other species, including species mm -hmm. in the ocean. Um, on your introductory video, there was a sentence about how important the ocean is to produce much of the oxygen that we breathe. But most of the oxygen that is produced in the ocean is produced by a bacteria, by a microbe so small that we didn't know about its existence only until 30 years ago. So something that we completely ignored is absolutely vital for the survival of humans and every other creature that uh, breathes oxygen. The uh, ocean also regulates our climate. Uh, coral reefs, mangroves protect shorelines from the destructive power of storms, which are much and more, um, much more frequent and severe because of global warming. So, you know, we need the ocean to do all these things for us for free, so Earth could be a place that, as wonderful to live in as as it is now. 
So you're talking so convincingly about the importance of the ocean. Why is that message not being communicated broadly? Do we need more Jacques Cousteau's underwater or what needs to happen to help people understand the importance of the ocean? Well, I'm funny you mentioned Jacques Cousteau because when Jacques Cousteau, Jacques Cousteau was my idol when I was a little kid, all I wanted to be was a diver in the Calypso on, on, on his ship. But, you know, when Cousteau was showing us the beauties of the underwater world in the 70s, there were three TV channels. And he was the only one showing us uh, what was going on underwater. Today, we have hundreds of cable channels and we have hundreds of thousands of people posting underwater photos. It's, the communications world is so fragmented that it's difficult to, to get uh, you know, reliable information. Uh, it's difficult. There is no one-stop shop. So that's a, that's a big problem, I think. But also, and you asked me before how you become a, an explorer in residence. Well, I used to be, in my previous life, I used to be an academic. I was a professor at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in, in La Jolla, in California. And my job was to study the impacts of humans in the ocean, the impacts of fishing, global warming, and publish it in peer-reviewed scientific journals. That was our, our job as academics. And I kept publishing these papers showing with more and more data how we were killing ocean life all around the world. So I felt like I was writing the obituary of the ocean, actually rewriting the obituary of the ocean with more and more precision. And that, was, of course, was totally frustrating. And I decided to quit academia and go, come to National Geographic to be able not only to communicate to a larger audience, not only to communicate to key decision makers about the problems of the ocean, but actually propose sol solutions, uh, show solutions. So instead of people switch, switching to another channel, actually they'll, they'll realize, oh, yeah, there's a problem, but this is something that uh, can work. So why don't we replicate those success stories? So I want to ask you about one recent, one of those recent academic publications that suggested that uh, five of the hottest years in the ocean were in the last six years, I think. It was the Journal of Atmospheric Science. Um, what does this mean, a warming ocean? What does it mean for life on Earth? What does it mean for the planet? It means a few things. One is something that people have experienced uh, around the Caribbean, for example. When the water, the seawater gets warmer, then uh, the, there is a lot more heat, a lot more energy in that part of the ocean. And when hurricanes go through, through the Caribbean, they are energized in a disproportionate way, but all that extra heat. And that, of course, produces catastrophic loss. And we have more and more severe um, hurricanes, for example. Another way that this affects humans is by making marine life move around. We have species in the tropics where in some places like tuna, for example, which is key for the food security of many, the tuna are moving away from their traditional grounds because the water is getting too warm. So they are moving either east or north or south. So we see this movement of species. So this is going to affect food security for many coastal nations, especially in tropical developing nations. The problem is that the tropical species can move north or south, but the species living in the poles, they have nowhere to go. So these are just two examples, one physical and the other one in terms of food security of how a warming ocean can affect humanity. Of course, in the last few years, there's been a, a much wider acceptance of the notion of climate change. What role can the ocean play in helping us to overcome climate change? Can it be a beneficial role? Yeah, this is a key question, Francis, because the ocean is both a victim of climate change, but it can be also a solution. The ocean is suffering from warming and increasing acidification loss of coral reefs, um, movement of species decline in, in the productivity of, of fisheries. But also, the ocean absorbs uh, about a quarter of all the CO2 emissions that we expel into the atmosphere. And what would help is to have more marine life in the ocean, because it is marine life that captures much of the ocean, from microscopic algae living offshore to kelp forests living on, on the shores, or whales. No, I just came back from uh, well, in December from an expedition in Dominica, an island in the Caribbean. And one, one thing that is amazing about Dominica is, is that it has this resident population of sperm whales. Sperm whales, they are as big as a school bus and they are toothed whales. 
they go down 3,000 feet for 45 minutes to catch, to hunt giant squid in total darkness. They use their sonar. They come back to the surface, then they rest for 15, 20 minutes, and they go back down again for a 45 minute dive on a single breath and over and over and over. So they catch squid, they catch um, matter from the deep, bring it to the surface, and then of course they defecate and they create these big brown clouds on the surface. That fertilizes the surface waters and that makes those microscopic algae bloom. And microscopic algae, like the plants on the land, they do photosynthesis. They use energy from the sun, they capture CO2 from the environment, and they produce sugars for their bodies and oxygen. So when they die, they sink. Many of them sink to the bottom of the ocean, and that carbon that is in these billions and billions of cells is going to be captured on the seafloor forever. So whales help us absorb CO2, store CO2 forever, and help mitigate climate change. The problem is that we kill whales uh, industrially in the last few centuries, and they um, were protected in 1985. They are coming back, but imagine if the whales were at the levels, uh, pre-industrial, pre-hunting levels. The whales would be helping to capture much more of our CO2. So this is the main point here that the more life there is in the ocean, the more that marine life can help us absorb our, our carbon pollution. Enrique, in my last conversation with uh, the mayor of Boise, we talked about the 30 by 30 initiative. And recently, a UN biodiversity conference came up with a pledge among 200 countries, I think, um, to conserve 30% of land and oceans. Is 30% enough? Yeah, I was there in Montreal after three um, plus years of work um, for many, many people and groups around the world and, and living countries. And now we have agreed, the world has agreed to protect at least 30% of the of the planet, land and sea by 2030. And Jack, my friend, Jack Dungermon, a few minutes before said that uh, we need more. Actually, we need half of the planet. If we want to prevent the collapse of our life support system, if we want nature to help us prevent a climate catastrophe, while of course we reduce our carbon emissions, we need half of the planet in natural state. That would also help prevent the extinction of what's projected to be a million species going extinct this century. And again, it is all these creatures there from the tiny mic microbes in the ocean, to the whales, to the plants on the land, to the walls of Yellowstone that Jack mentioned also. It is thanks to this biodiversity, this complexity of life, that we have a stable planet. The planet is destabilizing because of those combined crises of nature loss and global warming. So we need to reduce our emissions, but also we need to rewild our planet. And that's the target. 20% at least by 2030, and ideally by 2050, half of the planet would be on a natural state, and that would be much better for humanity, because right now there is not enough wild nature to be able to support 8 billion people or you know, 10 billion people coming soon. Enrique, I want to challenge you a little bit. It sounds so great. How do we go about doing it? What about the implementation? That's the key, implementation, right? Because we all have heard of um, as ambitious targets before, but one of the main uh, issues at the biodiversity conference in, in Montreal last December was uh, the financing. Who is going to pay for this? Right? And it is, and the change, the case of global warming is mostly the global north that has created the problem, and and now also including China, and it is the developing countries, the global south, that are suffering the most, and they do not have the financial resources to be able to to act to um, co carry out the actions for mitigating climate change, for reducing emissions, etc. The implementation is going to come at, at the end of the day is going to come at the country level because it is every country that is going to decide how much of their lands and waters to protect. This is why it's so important not only for the global north to provide funding so um, the global south can actually protect the areas that are most important for biodiversity and still in, in, a, in a better shape, but also it is very important to understand that you know, we have to dispel the myth that we cannot protect more of the planet 
we cannot protect more of the land or of the ocean because we need to exploit more fisheries. We need to cut more forests to be able to feed more people. That's a myth. We know from hundreds of examples around the world and from our, our own studies that if we protect the right 30% of the ocean, that 30% is going to produce a spillover of fish that actually is going to help replenish the fisheries around. So this is not just a question of biodiversity. This is a question of food security and the security of human civilization as we know it. So, Enrique, you know, we've got this commitment of 200 countries on a that's on a, a global level. Still, I think so many people don't have the connection that you have to the oceans. They don't understand the oceans in the same way that you do. What more do we need to do to communicate to people about the importance of the oceans? Well, one thing I learned after 14 years at National Geographic Society that is that we cannot communicate enough because people are bombarded. There's so much uh, information out there, but not all that information is actually relevant and important. So we cannot communicate enough. The best thing one can do is to go out in nature, to swim uh, on a coral reef or a kelp forest or wade on the marshes of the Chesapeake Bay or go to a, a local forest. But um, fortunately for everybody, we have such a plethora of nature documentaries, like the ones we have with uh, National Geographic, our own program, Pristine Seas. And there are many other opportunities, other many, many platforms online where people can actually not only um, educate themselves, but uh, yeah, learn a lot about, about nature. But there is something that we need for people to go from inspiration to action. And when I say people, it's not just people like you and me, but also uh, country leaders, uh, community leaders, which is experience that sense of awe. And that sense of awe, why, you cannot replace this with a documentary. You actually have to experience this firsthand. So the more people learn from all these amazing media out there about the ocean. Um, and after that, the more time people spend in the ocean, you know, the more likely it is that they are going to feel the sense of awe and wonder. And then that's the, that's the trigger for behavior change. So I am so curious to hear what you have to say about aquariums. I've spent much of my life in Baltimore and I have been struck by the extraordinary sharks in that central aquarium. Are aquariums a way to teach people? Are they good for the uh, creatures that live there? What, what, what role do they play in, in inspiring people in the way you say they need to be inspired? Yeah, aquariums are very important. I have a disclaimer. I am uh, on the board of directors of the National Aquarium in Baltimore. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I really like that aquarium. But, you know, there are aquariums that um, have... Uh, entertainment, right? They have uh, large animals like orcas and dolphins and sea lions, and they use entertainment for commercial purposes. There are aquariums that are much more educational in, in purpose, like the uh, Monaco Oceanographic Museum, for example. But you know, I'm very proud of the National Aquarium in Baltimore because they did have uh, for dolphins. Um, and under the leadership of the, of the director, John Racanelli, you know, the, we all decided, uh, they decided, and of course we as a board supported that uh, those dolphins, there is no room for such intelligent social creatures uh, mm. in small tanks in an aquarium just to make people uh, applaud. Mm. So the National Aquarium is uh, spearheading a project to return those dolphins to a natural habitat. And so we can learn from that, uh, how can we um, free all of these uh, wonderful, large, intelligent social creatures from these uh, confined spaces um, and, and return them to a habitat where we can learn actually how to bring them back where, where they are supposed to be. Enrique, I have a question from the audience. We always like to bring in viewers. And this one comes from McKenna Sonos. I'm going to read it. Uh, she's from California and wants to know what small things can everyday people do that will make a difference to help mitigate climate change over the long term? Good question from uh, McKenna Sonos. No, thank you, McKenna. So there are so many things, but I'm going to just mention one. And the, the best thing we can do, which is good for our health and for the environment, is eat more plants and less animals. Because uh, um, beef, for example, takes a huge amount of land for 
grazing or the feed that is um, directed to, to feed them, it uses enormous amounts of water. It produces enormous amounts of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So eating more plants actually would reduce the amount of land that we need to feed ourselves. And that land could be given back to nature to rewild itself. So it can produce many more benefits to us, to humanity, than just meat. And also the amount of greenhouse gas emissions would be reduced. And also, you know, I, I'm a vegetarian. It's, it's good for your health. So eat more plants, less animals. I think I have time for one last question to squeeze in before I let you go. Um, what's the biggest misconception in your view that people hold about the oceans and marine biodiversity? Yeah, well, first, you know, because of that ignorance of what's um, under the surface, there, there are all these uh, myths and misconceptions. Uh, one is that the ocean is so large, so vast, that you know, we, there is no way we can uh, deplete it. But it is clear uh, from the last 70 years after World War II that we have taken fish out of the ocean faster than they can reproduce. And now most of the fish stocks are, are overfished. But the good news, and I like to end on a positive note, is that people should know that if we give time and space to the ocean, the ocean can recover spectacularly. I have seen it with my own eyes. I have been to places that were depleted, overfished. After they were protected from fishing and other damaging activities, marine life has come back spectacularly. The fish are larger, more abundant. And we know that the large females produce a disproportionately larger amount of eggs. So they help to replenish the populations more and more. So it's like you have a savings account that grows with compound interest, where you reinvest your returns in, in uh, making the principle larger. That's what happens in these marine reserves in areas that are protected. And there, is, there are so many fish in these areas that they spill over and they produce so many babies to help replenish the areas around. So fishermen are catching more. The, uh, they are better off now fishing around these marine reserves than what they did before when they were able to fish all over the place. Also economically, we know that for every dollar invested in marine reserves, or by the way, in the US national parks, every dollar invested generates $10 in economic output. And of course, uh, they create many, many jobs. So that's, that's the main message. We are depleting ocean life. We are diminishing the ability of the ocean to provide for us all these essential things we need to survive. but we have a chance, we can give the ocean a sp a space and time, and the ocean more than the land has this extraordinary ability to bounce back. The ability to bounce back, what a wonderful message to, to leave us with. Enrique Sala, thank you so much for joining us on Washington Post Live. Thank you so much for having me, Francis. I hope we'll have another chance another time. In the meantime, if you viewers would like to find out about future programming, please go to WashingtonPostLive.com. WashingtonPostLive.com. I'm Francis Steed Sellers. Thank you so much for joining us today.